Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to take quite a different approach to this topic. It's internal challenges, external factors. I'm going to be looking at the external aspect of this topic. But in particular, I'm actually going to be the mirror image to Veldiv Merkav's uh, presentation. I'm actually going to be looking at the whole issue of development assistance in the Pacific, but from the donor's perspective. And I'm not talking about the, uh, if you like, the humanitarian objectives of development assistance in the Pacific. I'm going to be looking at it from the geostrategic perspective. As Valdis said, you know, each country, and he was talking about Latvia, it's important to identify what your national interest is. I'm going to be looking at development assistance from the perspective of the national interest of each of the donors and just give you a little bit of a tour d'horizon of what that actually means in the Pacific. First, let me just give you a broader geostrategic um, introduction to the Pacific. I'm aware that while some of you in the audience know it much better than I do, some of you are from the north and sometimes it's important just to, to have a bit of a, um, a, an introduction to what the Pacific is about from a geostrategic perspective. I've put up a map. I always find maps terribly instructive in terms of introducing you to, if you like, the geostrategic reality of a region. And you can see from that map that Australia dominates. Not only does it dominate, that apart from uh, New-Zealand, it is in a region which has got um, all developing countries. It's also in a region with the largest number of microstates in the world. So just two, two factors that I want you to just tuck away. But one of the things that uh, is very important about the Pacific region is, I beg to differ with Alistair, distance is no longer a factor for the Pacific. One third of the world's gross domestic product is now coming from Asia Pacific. And much of that is driven by China's own economic ascendancy. So the Pacific, which was once distant to the centres of economic power, is actually in the backyard. It's now very close. As you can see with this map, 1980, the centre of economic uh, power was very much um, Atlantic-based in terms of the US and Europe. You get a movement, unfortunately I can't do the movement on this, this uh, PowerPoint, but you have this movement that increasingly until 2050 you see what's happening in terms of the real centre of economic power in the world and of course where does that happen to be? It happens to be, as I say, the backyard of the Pacific. So it's evident that Pacific Island countries will be increasingly engaged with Asia Pacific's economic powerhouse. In step with this increased economic engagement is a rise in China's influence across the region. And this is being made itself felt on a number of fronts, and most notably uh, in its donor activities in the Pacific. Now, those of you who've looked at uh, China's aid programs, whether it's here or in Africa or elsewhere, know that it's very difficult to, to ascertain with any certainty what the size of the program is because of the, the reluctance on the part of the Chinese government to release actual figures. But a report that was released by my own institute in 2011 shows that uh, China's soft loans to the Pacific increased from 23 million US dollars in 2005 to over 183 million US dollars in 2009. So that's a significant increase in just four years. And aside from the aid relationship, the region's trade with China has also grown steadily over the past 10 years. Now, China's rise in its influence across the Pacific has not gone unnoticed by other countries, notably the USA. So in March last year, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton 
literally warned the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that the USA was in competition with China in the Pacific. By late 2011, that was pretty tough words, the rhetoric had actually softened. But nevertheless, the significance of Asia Pacific as a key driver of global politics, and within that, China, was set out clearly in Clinton's essay, interestingly called America's Pacific Century, which was published in the um, November 2011 issue of Foreign Policy. So, while the South Pacific is probably less important in terms of the, uh, the bigger diplomatic uh, and economic and strategic interactions taking place in, in the Northern Pacific, the USA has certainly recognised that the South Pacific is not to be overlooked in the US's assertion of itself as a Pacific power. This was made clear by President Obama during his visit to Australia last November when he stated that the new focus of the USA on Asia Pacific reflected a fundamental truth, that the US was a Pacific nation, had always been and will always be. So for Australia, this stronger engagement by the world's major powers with the neighbourhood where Australia, as most of you know, has long been the dominant actor, raises new questions for Australia's own relationship with its own region. Yet despite three changes in foreign ministers in four years, Australia's management of the foreign affairs portfolio has not brought a change to the policy settings which shape Australia's relationship with the Pacific. The continuing emphasis in the relationship is to support and encourage stability and prosperity. This has given substance in a number of ways, but most notably through Australia's aid program, which continues to have as one of its top priorities assistance to Pacific Island countries. Economically, Australia dominates in this region which is characterised by diversity and levels of development. Of the 16 members of the Pacific Islands Forum, 14 are developing countries and the other two are the main providers of the development assistance to the other 14, that is Australia and New Zealand. This imbalance is exacerbated by the very wide divergence in the profile and substance of the region's economies. While Australia's annual per capita is in the vicinity of about 44,000 US dollars a year, the annual per capita income of Solomon Islands, for example, is just about 1,000 US dollars. Population profiles reflect the great variations, with around 36 million people living across the region. More than 60% of them happen to be in Australia not surprisingly given the size. But this you have to contrast with the populations of some of the microstates. Niue, for example, with 1,500 people. Tuvalu, 10,000. And as I mentioned before, the, the Pacific is home to the largest number of microstates in the world. Australia's hegemonic position in the region brings with it expectations by the broader international community, which has long looked to Australia in partnership with New Zealand to support the development and security aspirations of the region's developing country. Now, this is where it gets to the national interest aspect. For Australia, this responsibility rests very easily with the core of its own national interests. Governance and security challenges periodically, but quite regularly, threaten the stability of parts of the region. And this is Australia's backyard. It is clearly in Australia's own interests to take a leading role in assisting the smaller countries of the region to achieve their own social and economic aspirations as a way of reducing the potential for instability and insecurity. So it's not surprising that a little less than one quarter of Australia's aid budget 
currently goes to PNG and the Pacific. Australia remains by far the largest donor to the region, providing more than 50% of the bilateral donor funds flowing into the region. Overall, it's important though to see how this looks in terms of other bilateral donors to the region. And we have here, this is the um, chart from the OECD's Development Assistance Committee, that is the first six um, silos. So you see Australia sits there dominating the others, followed by USA, followed by New Zealand and France on fairly equal pegging over a three-year period, then Japan. What I've introduced here is the China figure. China, of course, is not a member of the Development Assistance Committee, but it's important to see where it stands in terms of what we think is the contribution of China to the region. I'm going to take you briefly, because we don't have much time, I'm going to take you briefly through each of these um, six countries so you can see more clearly what their real, in well, what some of their interests are in the Pacific. Australia's budget this year is 1.17 um, billion into uh, the whole of the Pacific. And its development objectives are very much the core principles that were outlined in the Port Moresby Declaration in 2008. They're also in line with the Forum Compact, or more precisely, the CANS Compact on Stren Strengthening Development Coordination in the Pacific, which guides Australia's aid as it does all donor partners in the Pacific, except China, because China, when the um, Cairns Compact was put to the Pacific Islands Forum in 2009 and Cairns refused to sign on. So for Australia, its aid to the Pacific is very much a two-pronged objective. While development and prosperity are at the core, so too are the strategic and security interests. The USA um, is the next biggest OECD donor to the region. But the DAC stats can actually, the Development Assistance Committee statistics can actually be misleading. In line with the USA's rebalancing of its priorities towards Asia and the Pacific, it decided in 2011 to reopen a regional office, a regional USAID office in the Pacific. First, this was going to be in Fiji, but ultimately it opened in PNG in Port Moresby earlier this year with a relatively modest budget of around 20 million US dollars. Where the US's real ODA spending is, and that's what makes it second, is to its uh, compact states, those states which are have a compact of free association with the US, and that's the Federated States of Micronesia, Marshalls and Palau. The US treats these nations uniquely by giving them access to many US domestic programs, including disaster response and recovery and hazard mitigation programs. The compact also allows the US to operate armed forces in compact areas, to obtain land for operating bases and excludes the militaries of other nations without US permission. China, which is around about the next biggest. Globally, China provides uh, overseas development assistance on a scale which is comparable to mid-sized aid donors such as Australia, Belgium and Denmark. In terms of its uh, foreign aid grants, the United States still remains the largest foreign aid donor, far exceeding China. However, how much China is actually spending is very difficult to determine, although it did release its first ever white paper on aid last year, which shows that um, to the end of 2009, China had provided in it, well, almost 40 billion US dollars in development assistance. But we don't know over how many years. Is this 
from when it first started providing development assistance, which was in the 1950s. Is this over the last 10 years? Is this over the last five years? Is this over the last year? We don't know. But what we do know, what they have provided in the aid paper, is a proportional breakup of what's been given to whom. And in that, we see that 4% was provided to the Pacific. So, while it doesn't release details, I guess some observers believe that this is for more domestic reasons than uh, foreign policy reasons. Domestic reasons because there are large parts of China where poverty is still widespread. There is a concern that if their own people knew how much they were actually spending on foreign aid, that there would be internal dissent. But even China, realises that it has to increasingly become less opaque to its own people, hence the release of the white paper last year. So we don't know really how much China is spending in the Pacific, but as I mentioned earlier, the Lowy Institute has determined or estimated that soft loans in 2009 were over 183 million US dollars. Now we move on to New Zealand. And the Pacific is the core geographic focus for New Zealand's aid program. Over half of New Zealand's aid goes to the region. And according to the New Zealand aid program, the Pacific is New Zealand's own neighbourhood and New Zealand has the cultural, economic and social links with the region that can influence positive change. And it sees very much its role as being a continuing development partner to the region. Of the other two significant bilateral donors to the Pacific, France's official development assistance, as recorded by the OECD, is very much limited to Wallace and Fortuna, where it receives around about 140 million Australian dollars a year for a population of 15,000. Japan is the other major donor, bilateral donor, and in 2010 it provided something like 176 million US dollars. Japan has taken the initiative of having a regular meeting with Pacific leaders called PALM, and it's notable that um, at this year's meeting, it was the first time that the US was actually invited to attend or did attend the meeting. Um, this is seen as a way in which Japan is addressing the US's increased interest in the Pacific. It's also uh, seen as a way in which Japan is concerned about the rising influence of China. Now, I have one last slide to show you, and I think this is an important one for, for all of us. This shows how much the Pacific receives per capita in development assistance. This, this figure comes from 2010. You'll see that Oceania, according to the OECD, received $221 dollars, US dollars per person in the year 2010. The next largest re recipient of overseas development assistance is Africa, which received $47 per person per capita. I think it goes to demonstrate the significance of development assistance in this region. And it, I would hope, encourage you you to actually consider some of the various reasons why the Pacific receives by far, on a per capita basis, the lion's share of the world's overseas development assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Anna.